Big Daddy is on the scene. Yes, sir. I'll take off my shades, roll up my sleeves, spit on John Gamble's spray amplifier, and get ready to go. <laughs> hey, listen, uh, gee, there's a lot of great things in store for us. You know, people who enjoy the good life. And I presume you enjoy the good life. All kinds of groovy stuff ready for us. In fact, now you can now buy for your home, you know, for decor in your house. You, of course, all know about this now, I'm sure. Well, you know how you used to be able to buy uh, plastic geraniums and all that stuff? You can now buy plastic pot. Did you know that? Yeah, beautiful plastic marijuana plants. For those who are interested in good life. Plastic good life. Reset that, Marty. We're going to need that. Reset that. I'm singing pretty good. I like doing musical, you know. It's real good when you play my juice, I have to sing, yell, and holler. Great musical, you know. I kick Ethel Merman around. You know, do the whole bit. And the good old summertime. I can sing as loud as she can. I don't have such a good agent, though. Hey, listen, the speaking of uh, plastic pot. Yes, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, no, 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 I'm not advocating anything. I merely report the scene as it is, friends. In the good old summertime. In the good old... I'm getting all my little toolies ready here. Oh! 34 pounds of juice up. Hit me on the kneecap. Fantastic. Oh, boy. Well, all right, all right, we're all ready to go. Hey, listen, uh, speaking of being ready to go, here it is. It's the beginning now. You know, the summer's starting, everything's you know, getting underway. Tom Seaver's been knocked out of the box once already. And things are moving along. Well, of course, I told you that rubber chicken circuit will do it every time, Tom. You're going to need Jack Aker every day, man. Unless you stop that business, you know. You can't get right down there and knuckle down. In the good old summer. Stick a couple of them in our ears. That's what you do. In the good old summer time. Well, now, uh, here, we got to get down here. This is a serious program, son. Very serious. Mm-hmm. It is, really, actually. A lot of business here to take care of. First of all, I want to I want to thank uh, yeah very official thank you. You would thank officially people, uh, all uh, the kids that uh, took the time to send in uh, stories that they had written as a result of this press conference we had at the Overseas Press Club uh, last month. It, uh, gee, the stories are great, and uh, I can only tell you this: my feeling very strongly if. A lot of the kids that are writing for high school and college papers today were to go into the newspaper business as a profession. Man, the newspapers would make a comeback. I'm serious. Some great this stuff. Speaking of newspapers, I hear that there was a story in the Trenton Times. Was it the Trenton Times? Over this weekend in the Sunday edition of the Trenton Times about the show we did last week at Princeton. I didn't see this. I mean, I didn't see the paper. I mean, just I was told by a listener type who stopped me on the street. I said, I wrote about you in the Trenton Times. I said, the Trenton Times? You know, I figured, uh, you know, public figure nabbed in raid, something like that. And uh, <laughs> it turned out to be that. Did any of you see it out there? I'd like to hear it, you know, from you. If, uh, if you did, was it, uh, was it good? I mean, anybody that was at the show at Princeton and also saw this piece, I don't know. You know, uh, speaking of... Uh, of a newspaper writing. Uh, I'm going to do a serious show tonight, if you don't mind, about something that is right now currently in the news, very much so. I notice every writer, whoever once saw maybe at seven miles away on the stage, the Beatles is now writing a piece on the Beatles because of the, you know, the imminent breakup of the Beatles. You've probably read a lot of stuff about the Beatles breaking up. And uh, tonight, uh, I'm going to talk about the Beatles, if you don't mind. Yes, I have had a very much involvement with the Beatles from time to time over the past years. 
And for those of you who are not aware of this, I will have to give you some historical perspective. A few years back, and now what ticked me off on this was Pete, now come on, come on, let's cut it out in there. Pete Hamill's piece in the Post tonight. Seems that Hamill once met the Beatles. And, of course, personal journalism today is such that if you've ever met anybody once or was in the same room with them once, you write the story as if uh, the whole action involved you, you know. It's like uh, if Jimmy Breslin was ever in the room once with uh, with ex-President Johnson, he writes the whole piece as though, you know, Johnson was arguing with him and he was... It's, uh, this is personal journalism. It's a whole new thing, you know. If you, if you go to Armageddon, you don't report on Armageddon. You report on uh, how Armageddon swirled around you. You were the central figure of it. And uh, that's a new technique, and it works, particularly in New York, where people seem to be more gullible about things like that than in other parts of the country. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like Broadway is about Leonard Lyons, somehow, you know. Uh, it really is, you know. He's constantly on the phone. If Richard Burton isn't calling him, the Shah of Iran is on the other phone calling in, you know. Jackie drops by from time to time to let him know, you know, that, that she wants him out at the place next week. It's a whole big, yeah, well, it's a whole big thing, see. In fact, I remember one of the saddest examples of that that I heard, a local guy who, I, it doesn't make any difference what his name is, but a few years back I was invited to, a, like everybody else in the business, I was invited by a record company to be at a big place where Frank Sinatra was going to be, uh, on the kickoff of some kind of a whole new record contract kind of thing. It's a big public uh, event, not event really, it's a public relations shtick where everybody who was ever remotely involved in any kind of a radio station or disc jockey show or anything to do with public uh, communications was invited. There were guys, you know, from the 12 line stations in Pitcairn, Pennsylvania, you know, they all arrived all excited, you know, <laughs> there they were. They, so anyway, this place had about maybe 12,000 people in this giant ballroom. And, oh, yes, well, it's a tremendous big operation, you know. So that, I just happened to be driving along a couple of days later, and I heard a local famous disc jockey, by the way, on the air, a very famous guy. And he was talking about this friend, Frank Sinatra, who had recently a party that he was at. <laughs> and how... Uh, you know, uh, he and Frank were hoisting a few with a few friends, and I, I was listening to this thing, and, and it, was, it was like a surrealistic nightmare, really, because I saw the real party, you know, the party of 12,000 people. I had to see this guy at the party. He was so far out in left field, he didn't get, you know, 12 feet from the other side of the hors d'oeuvres table because of the crush of people. And the hero of the evening, who was Sinatra, made a few brief mentions, and they got up on the stage, and they rushed, rushed him in. You say, no, 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 no music. They rushed him in. And he uh, talked briefly over the PA system. You couldn't hear what he said because of the uh, feedback. He was rushed out by seven, maybe 12 bodyguards, leaped into his jet, and was on his way to Acapulco. And that was the end of the ball game. But to hear the guy talk about it, it was a great night they spent together, you see. And uh, so that's personal journalism. Personal journalism is don't worry about facts, friends. <laughs> Only report what you wish had happened. That's really, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, Johnson arguing with uh, Norman Mailer. Uh, this is a, people uh, go for this. It's nice. I mean, there's nothing, but don't take it too seriously is all I got to say, friends. Don't get swept up into it. But nevertheless, uh, it's fascinating how eras do end almost exactly on the turn of a decade. I've noticed this before, and I think other people have noticed it too. And, uh, it's it rarely as dramatic, though, as when you can clearly see it. Here it is, the first few months of 1970, a brand new decade. And already things which were uh, very uh, much prior to the 1960s scene are already dissolving. By 1975, the Beatles will be just a vague memory. That's quite true, even though they seem to be, you know, so much in the news right now. How many of you remember... When the biggest news item, oh man, there were more reporters following around taking pictures and great, fantastic moment when Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis broke up. Very few people today remember that they were even together. <laughs> and, uh, and that was the biggest thing since uh, the signing of the Magna Carta in New York. And uh, it was oh, a tremendous thing. Well... I'll tell you what I remember about the Beatles, and I'll have to give you a little perspective on this. I'm not uh, 
Yes, this is WOR. Before we do that, it's in New York, of course. Where else? And uh, speaking of New York, I have a recommendation for you New York types. If there's a new place in town that is getting a lot of talk. It's on East 58th Street, 41 East, in fact. It's just off Fifth Avenue, off Madison, actually. It's 58th off Madison, 41 East 58th, and it's called Frank's Place. And they have this great brunch and all that stuff. And real, uh, you know, it's a, it's a real place to go on a Sunday a morning or uh, Sunday afternoon after you've drug out of bed and had a you know, big night with Barbara Streisand and the whole crowd, you know, and you and yeah, uh, you're feeling a little distant gay. After, you know, I was spending the whole night arguing with Jimmy Breslin. You know, after all you're a real New Yorker, you know, fist fighting a bit with uh, with uh, Nat Hentoff and uh, you know, a little discussion. You have to pick up the phone and call John Lindsay and tell him you're on your way to Frank's place. Well uh, you know, meet the whole gang there. It's, it's at the 41 East 58th Street off Madison. Of course, Gloria Stein will, Stein will drop by and you'll have a, a caviar omelet together. Well, you know, we're all one big thing here, all us beautiful people. And if you'd like to get into it, I would suggest you drop by Frank's Place. They have mini breads, maxi drinks, and uh, fantastic food. And they're open every day for lunch and dinner, late supper, particularly to a big Sunday brunch. And uh, when you drop in there, be sure... Be sure to call, uh, oh, uh, you know, any one of the other people in New York, Maya Pocacino or somebody, have them drop by. So, anyway, that's uh, Frank's place. All right, now, all, all set in there, you guys? All right, now I can see your show. Okay. Now, uh, oh, yes, uh, oh, well, listen, there's nothing like all of us gathering down at the Lion's Head in the village, you know, fist fighting and arguing, you know, talking over the old days when Dylan Thomas was here. You know. Well, it's, it just goes on all the time among us little rat eye here in New York. How, uh, however, um, <laughs> not bad news. What do you mean? I'm a qualified writer, too. <laughs> but uh, that's not here to there. Uh, well, yes, it is, of course. But uh, my connection, and I, and I had and do have a real involvement, or did have at one point in my career, a real involvement with the Beatles. And this is not, I'm going to preface this by saying I'm, I'm attempting to give you uh, to eradicate myself as much from this as I can, but this is what happened. A few years back, uh, when the Beatles were just approaching the zenith of their career, uh, let's see, what was the actual year, Lady? Do you recall? 64. This was even before Pete Breslin probably heard of them. But in 1964, uh, I received a, a call from an editor in fact, it was one of the editors who I've worked with from time to time over the years at Playboy. You probably are aware that I write a great deal for Playboy. By the way, nothing is more amusing to me than to get the the eternal letters from ladies who say, Mr. Shepard, well, how do you persist in writing for that magazine that you know and we all know is pure filth? And uh, <laughs> they, they write for continually. I suppose these are the ladies who really believe that the Atlantic Monthly is with it. And, uh, well, you know, no accounting for taste. But nevertheless, uh, in 1964, it was about, uh, I would say, midsummer of 64, roughly, I got a call from this editor, and he said that uh, their London office had, uh, you see, Playboy, like most major magazines, has an office in various major cities around the world for a lot of reasons. And uh, Playboy has a London office. And the London office had uh, contacted the Beatles, who were at that time definitely on the rise. This was before they made their movies. And uh, just about the time they were beginning to break through from being just a simple rock group to become almost a uh, phenomena that would probably go down as the most typical thing of the 60s. They were, through the 60s, what, uh, oh, uh, Lenny Bruce and Mort Saul were to the 50s. They, in a sense, uh, were uh, indicative of a, whole, of a whole period of time. And when that time passed and things changed rapidly and their whole, the world changed and they changed. And uh, so at the end of this decade, the Beatles and the longer the Beatles, they've suddenly become, again, what they always were. Four separate and distinct people with very different attitudes towards things. Uh, for a long, well, this is well, let's face it, uh, the four human beings, and uh, for years people somehow had the feeling that the Beatles were a thing together. There was no such thing as a beetle; they were just beetles. 
and uh, they were interchangeable. And one was cute, and one was this, and one was that. But uh, they never, they never were that. And uh, in 1964, this uh, call came from London to the Chicago office of Playboy. They were planning to do a major piece, as you know. Playboy is. Uh, one of the most interesting things, I think, in the magazine has been their interview-type things. Their Playboy interviews have uh, really are read all over the world, in case you're curious, and so is the magazine. In, in in America, of course, it's considered, it's just a filthy magazine. Well, this is uh, the country that spawned the Reader's Digest, so we've got to read, we've got to remember a lot of things. We, we still have a lot of uh, residue of, uh, uh, you know, that go back to the Salem days that are still around the country. Let's face it, it's true. And so, around the world, though, the magazine Playboy is read as a serious literary magazine, which it is. Uh, and uh, the people who write for it are conscientious writers who, and in many cases, world-famous writers, people like uh, Lawrence Durrell, if you prefer his, the way he pronounces it, Durrell. Uh, people like uh, Raoul Dahl. Uh, many famous writers write continually for Playboy, so... Across the pond, as they used to say, Playboy is a serious American literary effort and highly respected. Well, uh, I received a call, getting back to this, the, the narrative here, uh, from uh, the Playboy office. I don't think I've ever even told this story in the air. I know I haven't told the actual facts of it on the air. Uh, from the Playboy office in Chicago, and the editor said, that, uh, how would you like to go to England and... Uh, live with the Beatles, travel with them, and uh, work with them. He says, you know, no uh, journalist has ever been allowed to do this. No journalist, you know, ever has actually traveled and lived with the Beatles. Uh, at least during that period, they didn't. Uh, ever since that time, uh, years later, it's it's changed somewhat. But at that time, they traveled around, and they had highly, highly uh, tight security around them, and they, they would allow nobody to travel with them. And uh, they had gotten permission from the office, the Beatle office, uh, NEMS Music in London, to send somebody. But uh, the Beatles re specifically requested that I be sent over to do it because the Beatles had heard my show when they were in New York. They had been here once. They had heard the show. They, they knew about my work, and they dug it, which was uh, you know very interesting to me. I was kind of surprised. I'm just telling you the truth of the story here. So... That was uh, that was the uh, that was the end of it. They they wanted a performer to travel. They didn't want somebody who just uh, would uh, would not understand what it was like being a performer. So I I said yes. I dig the whole thing. I'd love to go out. And they said the only thing is is you're going to have to leave and you have to go out with them for five weeks and live really we'll live with them uh, because they're going on a tour throughout England and uh, throughout Scotland and the various parts of uh, the British Isles. And it was one of their regular concert show tours. And in those days, the Beatles were not, uh, they were much bigger, and have been, by the way, for years, much bigger over here than they were there, you know, which uh, always surprises the people that were really Beatle, you know, maniacs. To find that true, they're really largely an American phenomenon. And uh, anyway, uh, when they travel around in, in uh, England at that time, they travel with a whole show, with the Beatles show. Uh, they had, uh, yes, they had with them uh, Tommy Steele travel with them. They had uh, another rock group. They had a couple of uh, girl singers, and it was a whole package. It was like a, a produced review, and at the end of the review, the Beatles would come out and would do their bit, and uh, it was it was the Beatles show. So I, I hopped on a plane. I said, I'd be glad to do it. I'd love to do it. So I got on a plane, flew to uh, London, and uh, while I was in London, uh, I stayed at uh, one of the people who was involved in the magazine. There's a townhouse there. And I stayed at this townhouse. And the first night I, I was in London, I, I called up the number that I was given to call. And I was talking to George. Uh, Harrison was on the phone. So we we discussed meeting the next day. And he says, well, why don't you come down? We're having a, we're going to be doing a thing tonight. So that, uh, we're just going to a little party tonight. Why don't you come on over? So I said, fine. I hopped into a cab and I took off to this location in London and there was a party going on. Just a party, really quite straight and stayed. It was just a party of people standing around and uh, drinking uh, scotch. And 
that's when I first met the Beatles. And uh, we then took off the next day at noon in a plane uh, to, let's see, the first uh, place we went to on this trip was, I believe, uh, Edinburgh. Yes, I believe it was. We, we took a plane to Edinburgh and arrived uh, the night before the concert. We took a hotel. The hotel was already booked, of course, by their office. And from that minute on, I was involved in the whole thing, uh, living with the Beatles. Actually, I lived with them, actually. Shared rooms and so forth. All around the continent, we played, uh, I can say we, uh, very well, because you get involved in this thing and you're, you're part of the troop, really, for, for this brief time. There were only three people traveled with them at the time. Uh, it was uh, their their band, uh, what could be called their band boy, really, the guy who manages all the uh, physical equipment, who sees to it that all the, the the drums and everything else are there and set up, and the stage is set up, and their electronic equipment is set up and so forth. In other words, he handles the, uh, the equipment manager. Then there's a guy who travels around and is kind of the PA public... Uh, he's really a flack. He, he handles all the public... Uh, uh, appearance things. He's a, he's a traveling, uh, road, uh, PR man, really. And then, uh, there were a couple of other people who really did little incidental things, like, uh, run out and, uh, get somebody, a, a, a jug of coffee, that kind of stuff. Just a little group of people, that's all. And it was a strictly very pared down operation, but highly organized. And, uh, very, very cut and dried. Uh, in every city, they did exactly the same things. Well, yes, uh, oh, very, because this is a business, a multi-million dollar business, remember that. And it was all done, a uh, very uh, tightly scheduled uh, operation. But uh, after a while, uh, living with the Beatles, we got to be very uh, involved with, you know, just one of it, just uh, hanging around. And so, uh, at that point, uh, I began to see that there were vast differences between the Beatles, of course. You would expect this to be so, but the public press never really wanted to face this. They really weren't a group of nice, carefree young boys. They were hard-working, professional musicians. And uh, very, very cold-blooded about it. Uh, extremely professional. Highly conscious of every night's gate receipts. Uh, very much involved in, in producing a top flight and creating a top flight show to his act, which they were. I remember, in fact, uh, one night in Dundee, it was a fascinating old moment, uh, in Dundee, which is a, a town on the coast of Scotland, uh, it was a kind of a dark, rainy night. We arrived there uh, late in the afternoon. The concert was to be at 8 o'clock. We arrived about, oh, possibly uh, 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And I, I went out for a walk around the town. Dundee is a is a kind of an interesting town in a lot of ways. Very, it, to me, it's a it kind of a kind of a, the epitome of Scottish cities. It's uh, dark and brooding, and there's a great, great water around it. And uh, there's a, a, a real uh, a real air there. It's a, it's a very colorful, odd place. And I went walking around town, little twisty streets and little grubby shops and so on, and uh, I could see the people all going home from work, and uh, I was wondering, you know, how the concert would go that night. And I, I picked up something to eat, and I went back to the hotel, where we were all staying, and uh, by then it was about uh, uh, half an hour or so before showtime, which was a little earlier, I think, in that city than it was in others, for other for reasons, local reasons, apparently, around 7 o'clock. And uh, we were backstage then, we went backstage in this old auditorium, and Paul was running around backstage in the, in the, uh, in the back room, which we had there for the performers and so on, and he was really bugged. Uh, apparently, uh, the uh, press had been not too good before they came in. The advertising was not good, and here it was just before showtime, and they still had a third of the empty. The auditorium was not filled, and uh, he was really bugged by that. And uh, there was a big argument going on between him and the guy who was running the uh, the uh, publicity and so forth. And, and uh, I remember the, the incident uh, that, that began to separate them all into, one, into various entities uh, that night with me. I remember John. John, uh, if you look in the Hamill's column tonight, uh, I must say this about what Hamill wrote. There is something in John that is uh, a kind of a, a violent truculence. There's a strange 
uh, he, he reminds you of the kind of guy from time to time that pops up in short stories and probably in your own life when you go into a go into a, a diner, we'll say, on a dark, rainy, stormy night in Jersey at four in the morning, and three guys at the sitting at the counter turn around and give you a hard look. And one of them gets up and comes over to the table like, what are you looking at me for? You want one in the mouth? You know, that, uh, that sinister quality. Well, John has a lot of this in it. And the curious thing about it, I've noticed this on, on other people I have known from time to time who commit themselves deeply and very publicly to nonviolence. I don't know whether people who do this, and this is, I'll just throw this out for what it's worth. I'm talking about people who make a big issue of violence, as if all the rest of the world is violent, and they're beautiful people. Uh, I wonder whether many of them are fighting against the thing which they see in themselves, and they hope by making a loud public outcry that people won't recognize it in them. I don't know. I'm just throwing this out as a, as a you know, a <laughs> this is a late night psychology. But uh, nevertheless, uh, John came over to me, and I was standing there talking to one of the others. I think I was talking to Paul. And uh, John came over, and he says, uh, Hey, uh, go out and get me some, some cigarettes. I said, What was that? I said, I want, Go out and get me a package of cigarettes, I said. I said, Friend, if you're asking me to get you a package of cigarettes, I would be delighted to get you a package of cigarettes. If you're telling me that I'd better go out and get you a pack of your cigarettes, I'm liable to tell you what to do with each one of those cigarettes and quite possibly do it myself. Lit. There was a pregnant pause, and that test was over. <laughs> I remember telling you about that that night, Lee, and that test was over. From that minute on, John accepted me, I guess, as an equal or something. And so we began to, you know, get deeply involved one with the other, and they're very four, very different people. And I began to rapidly see that, that George is the one who continually feels himself uh, kind of on top of it all. He sort of skims over the top of it and is somewhat sardonic and sarcastic about the other three all the time. Uh, and uh, he, there's a certain kind of... Uh, peculiar bitterness in, in him. I, it's hard to say, but it isn't a violent kind of bitterness, but a strange kind of uh, quality about him all the time as if he's vaguely disappointed in life. And uh, yes, he, he, he just sort of radiates that. His public appearances, of course, are very different. Uh, as soon as these people get on stage, like many performers, in fact, the best performers, they're really almost schizoid. The minute they're on stage, they become this thing. They're the Beatles that everyone knows. Uh, but the minute they're off stage, then they're themselves what they are. The workman of the group, I mean the serious workman, the guy that uh, really was deeply involved in, in uh, writing and the one who was always thinking of ideas and who was continually uh, and very much involved in the creative process was always Paul. Uh, Paul was fascinated uh, by a lot of things. First of all, I, I remember one night sitting backstage in Glasgow. I had my, my uh, Jews harp with me. I was playing the Jews harp. And Paul was very intrigued by this. And he had never really seen one. And uh, we, were, we, we went, uh, went on and on for hours about this. And Ringo, who thought it was all kind of funny, Ringo said, are you playing that stupid little plunker? Ringo was always saying, are you playing that little plunker, stupid thing? And uh, Ringo rarely said anything in the group. Ringo always felt himself, and I, in fact, one night, uh, he told this to me, and, I, and this is by way of personal reminiscence, so don't assume that I'm pulling a Breslin on you, but he, he felt that uh, he had uh, been a replacement. He wasn't one of the original Beatles, you know, and uh, he, he never really felt as if he were part of the group. He was just sort of uh, the guy they called in, and he he was uh, very diffident about it and really didn't feel like he had much to say in the whole thing and just sort of went along. And uh, yet, no, 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 they, they, they really discussed money. See, people who are not in that level of earning think that people who are in that level of earning do discuss money a great deal. That's because poor people do. <laughs> I'm sorry, but believe me, Onassis doesn't sit around and talk about money to... Uh, to uh, H.L. Hunt, I mean, or whoever it is he's running into, this is something that's just assumed. They don't, they don't, they were beyond that. But Ringo, 
Ringo was a, was a quiet little guy. And I remember when that Ringo, in casual conversation, mentioned the fact that he had invested a lot of what he had earned in a construction company. And uh, they were building houses in the Midlands. And uh, he was he was putting his dough into real estate because he he never really felt that it would last very long, and that was the end of it. He was going to uh, keep what he got and do what he could with it, and that's the kind of guy Ringo was. Very very by the way, a very personable little man. I enjoyed him very much. Uh, and I'll tell you a little anecdote about that uh, that came late in the tour. Uh, Paul was was uh, and is the most outgoing of the four. Paul is uh, very outspoken, very frank, and uh, he's open to ideas from other people continually. And one thing I liked about Paul, Paul uh, was always uh, ready to listen, and uh, not only listen, but uh, he was uh, he uh, <laughs> really listened. Now, uh, one night we were playing, to give you an idea how little things occur when you begin to see these things, uh, we, were, we were sharing a room in Torquay. Now... Um, that room, uh, that night, I, I remember very vividly because a lot of strange things had happened prior to that particular uh, date. Tor Torquay is a, is a town which is, uh, in a sense, the uh, English uh, Atlantic City. It's a boardwalk town. It's a town that people go to on their vacation and they spend uh, two weeks at the seaside. Uh, and uh, it's, it's got the taffy apple stands and the, all kinds of fish and chip stands and big old hotels. It looked, like, it looked like quite a bit like Atlantic City. Well, they were doing a show down there in Torquay. And uh, we arrived uh, after a lot of confusion and a lot of uh, 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 things that got shipped to the wrong place. And uh, it was one of those things. There's a constant battle to, to try to make everything come together when, the, when there's a group that's traveling. Well, we got into Torquay, and somebody mentioned uh, casually <laughs> that uh, that uh, some of their equipment had not arrived. And I was there when it happened, when it was mentioned. Well, John turned into a raving maniac. He was furious. I mean, he was he was uh, you know it was one of those things where you feel so sorry for the poor guy who was involved. That is the guy he's giving hell to. That the that the guy who worked 24 hours a day, there was a, a fellow who works as their manager, band manager, the guy that's in charge of the equipment, was he was just lashing at Ma, you stupid idiot, and upset. <laughs> He's trying it on. Poor guy, obviously was in, was in trouble. So uh, Ringo didn't say much, and and uh, Paul was trying to clear up the air, and uh, George was just walking around, kind of uh, smiling with a sardonic smile. And uh, that night, when we went out, they went on stage. Everything went off all right, and it was a, it was a smash hit, as uh, all of them were. And incidentally, in those days, uh, they they weren't even really performing. They would play a tape out over the PA system, and they'd meme the whole thing, and uh, it was quite an operation. So after the show, we went back up to the uh, hotel, and it seems that the hotel uh, had made a classic blunder. Uh, that uh, the show actually lasted longer than their bar was open. And there was hell to pay about that. So <laughs> we arrived up in the room, and uh, I, I believe it was, uh, I don't recall which one it was. He called down to the uh, to the desk and wanted a bottle of Johnny Walker sent up. Well, apparently that was uh, against the rules because the bar was closed and they had some kind of local regulation about this and again there was another big fantastic uproar in this hotel there was just the four or five of them sitting in the hotel a lot of hollering and and, uh, and uh, the obscenities and swearing and, and pretty soon the, the manager of the hotel came up and he was very embarrassed about the whole situation he was afraid that they would get into trouble with the authorities local authorities something to do with the liquor laws and here they were so he brought up in a, in a case, he brought up some of his own scotch, apparently, that he had had from his own home. And, uh, he was, uh, he was very, uh, cooperative and they left the scotch and he left. Well, that was a little moment that I was, uh, just involved in. And then Ringo went in and started to shave. And, uh, Ringo's in the, in the John shaving and he's, uh, he's, uh, <laughs> He was making uh, uh, little unconscious, constant, snide remarks about the whole thing, about this incident with the manager and so on. Paul was kind of amused by it. 
and it was hot in the room. And finally, I said, I'm going to get out. I'm, I'm tired of sitting here because it's just uh, yeah, just too much together. All of it. It, just, it just began to oppress me very much. I had to go. So I said, I'm going out. Anybody want to go out? And Ringo said, wait for me. And so the two of us went out about 3 o'clock in the morning and walked along the boardwalk. We must have walked for two hours and talked about uh, just about everything. And he was quiet, a very simple guy, and very, in, in many ways, uh, uh, almost the antithesis of the celebrity type. And we walked along the uh, boardwalk, and he was talking about Playboy, which he always read, and uh, he was asking, what's, what's Hefner early like? What, what, what is it? What is it? What is it? <laughs> and so we talked about that for hours, and we came, finally came back to the room, and uh, everybody started sitting around, and they'd gotten, uh, gotten some potato chips. And so we sat until late that morning, uh, eating potato chips, and talking about everything from the Queen down to... Uh, down to whether or not uh, Elvis Presley was actually God. By the way, the the uh, the, uh, the Beatles uh, were all fanatical Presley fans, and uh, they don't say much about that now, but they were, and very much influenced by Presley, very much influenced by a lot of people who were not very popular here. And there's incidentally, another one of their great favorites was Fats Domino, and uh, there were others that they were talking about, asked me if I knew them and so forth, and we went on and on about this. Well, that night sort of put it all in perspective. It, it drew it all together because from that time on, uh, things happened. The next night, we were on our way to another town in Scotland, but we had a night off. And this is when the, the very sad incident occurred. Between the two dates, we had been invited. When I say we, again, I mean the editorial. We, the Beatles had been invited and their party, the people with them, had been invited to spend a, a night sort of getting out of it all up in the highlands in Scotland in this magnificent uh, Scottish lake, Loch Erne, actually. It's not too far from Loch Lomond and the Scottish Highland, the great magnificent lakes up there. And I remember it was uh, uh, the the uh, the foliage was getting uh, gold and brown. It was just beautiful. Uh, the sun was out bright and sharp and the air was clear. You could smell, you actually can smell peat smoke uh, up in that area, just driving through these little country roads, and and we drove out to this place in the Beatles' uh, Austin Princess. They had an old car at that time, and and uh, one of the guys drove, the band guy drove it, and this great big limousine, old clunker of a car, and we roared out through the darkness, and of course they had to have all kinds of subterfuge. Uh, that, yeah, they sent out uh, fake cars, because millions of kids would follow the wrong car, and they sent out... Uh, they sent out the big Rolls Royce that looked like it. They had everything but the blown up rubber beetles sitting in it, so the kids would all chase them, say. And uh, they'd drive through the night, and you'd see kids lurking in the bushes, all trying to get a glimpse of the beetles. Well, they never, they never paid much attention to this old rattle trap. <laughs> so we drove on through the night. We finally arrived at this place, and uh, it was a kind of an embarrassing moment happened there. It was uh, supper time, late supper. Uh, it was about nine, ten o'clock, and Whoever was the host was apparently a very important guy, or else naturally he was he was important enough that the Beatles would come to where it was he invited them, which was this summer place up in the uh, in the Highlands. And it was a very nice party, a little small group of people there, and uh, so they had a supper set aside for just the five of us in another room, and that was when the terrible moment occurred. Uh, we went back to have supper. This was a very pleasant incident. That uh, the whole evening was very pleasant, and the Ringo was digging it, and Paul was digging it, and everybody was digging it, and people were very nice. So we went back to this little room, and they were serving us with this magnificent meal, which they prepared for the Beatles. And uh, there were the five of us sitting around this table, and uh, had a guy had a, a bottle of wine there, and they were serving us. And it was kind of a public inn, actually. It had been closed for this night. When suddenly, there was a tapping at the door. And uh, one of the Beatles got up and said something to somebody at the door. And it turns out that the host's daughter, who was a cripple, by the way, had a bad leg, about maybe 14 or 15, uh, wanted to come in and uh, 
So the Beatles, well, whoever it was, brought her in. So she came in, and, and all she had, she had a record, a Beatle record, and she wanted them to autograph it. And you could see she was just in fantastic seventh heaven. See. And uh, so she stood back, right back of me, and next to me was, uh, I believe, John, and on the other side was Ringo and Paul and George. And so she had the record, and she said, uh, Something, uh, would you, you know, I'm very pleased to meet you. Would you please, uh, I'd be honored if you'd uh, sign my record. Well, there was a moment of silence, and you could see that Paul and Rinko and, and uh, George, they didn't think anything of it, when all of a sudden, John turned. I'll never forget that moment. I said, get, will you, get, get, would you get out of here and quit bothering us while we're having our meal? Get out of here. And she slunk out. A terrible moment. And I felt so terrible. You could see Ringo felt real bad. Ringo started to look down. He started to eat his his uh, his food. And it was just a little strange moment in the lives of the four elves. And, uh, you know, the beautiful moment. And uh, at that time, I, I felt that they were beginning to drift already apart. And uh, sure enough, by late 65... Early 66, they were all going their separate ways. And now here it is in 1970, and it's become official. And uh, it's the end of another era. But I have thousands and thousands of stories about that trip that I've never really, uh, you know, talked about. Uh, because, uh, no, I would never write about it. Not that, uh, it's personal things, you know. And, uh, it was just a moment. But, uh, this uh, 1970 period, now I would say that by 1976, 1974 maybe, another great phenomenon will occur. I mean a group or something will develop that will be even bigger than that. Each succeeding era creates its, its icons. That's true. And uh, the Beatle era is over. Long live the Beatles.